So it's just past eight, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Michelle Rowe from uh, the University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital to present uh, at today's Nephrology Grand Rounds on Alport Syndrome. Uh, Dr. Rowe is the Division Director of, Nephrology, of Pediatric Nephrology um, at the University of Minnesota. She is also, she started her interest in, uh, in Alport when uh, she described the first mouse model of X-linked Alport uh, during her fellowship year, and then she switched gears to clinical trials in Alport. Uh, she's actually the uh, co-director of the Alport Syndrome Treatment and Outcome Registry, that's ASTAR, and she's involved in many clinical trials for therapeutic intervention in Alport. Uh, so, you know, we cannot, we can't have anyone else better to talk to us about this disease. Uh, so, you know, please, uh, Dr. Uh, Ro. Thank you so much for the invitation and so sorry to hear about all of the power struggles you guys have had the past couple um, couple days and hope everybody's getting back to normal. But this morning we're going to be talking a little bit about Alport syndrome. Um, these are my disclosures. I will be talking about some of the clinical trials. So Alport syndrome, um, just in general, is a progressive hereditary disorder of basement membranes. Um, it's a rare disease, but it's not that rare. So it's something that you are gonna run into um, in your clinic or your dialysis clinic. It accounts for about 1.3% of pediatric end-stage kidney disease and 0.4% of adult end-stage kidney disease in the US and probably pretty similar in Canada. And those numbers are probably a little bit higher now that we're doing more testing um, for type 4 collagen genes. The clinical features uh, are, include a glomerulopathy. So it starts with hematuria, proteinuria, and then chronic kidney disease. And then a, pr a proportion of people also have sensory neural deafness and eye abnormalities. And because I'm a nephrologist, I'm mostly gonna be talking about the kidney disease today. So the genetics of Alport syndrome is complicated. Um, it can be caused by mutations in three different genes, uh, col 4 a 5 which is on the X chromosome, or col 4 a 3 or col 4 a 4 um, on chromosome 2, which cause autosomal recessive or dominant Alport syndrome. And it's not clear why some patients with a single mutation in col 4 a 3 or col 4 a 4 just have a, a thin basement membrane nephropathy appearance on their biopsy and never go on to develop kidney disease, while some people with a single mutation do go on to develop full-blown Alport syndrome. So back when we were doing pedigree analysis and Sanger sequencing, um, it was thought that the autosomal dominant type of Alport syndrome was pretty rare. Only about um, less than 5% of patients with Alport syndrome had autosomal dominant disease. About 15% had autosomal recessive and the rest, the majority had X-linked disease. But now that we've been doing more next generation sequencing, we're finding actually a lot more patients with the autosomal dominant disease. And some um, studies out of Europe in the past 10 years show anywhere from 19 to 31% of patients have autosomal dominant disease. So this is becoming more and more um, uh, an issue. So type 4 collagen, of course, is required to make up the normal kidney filtration barrier um, with the endothelial cells and the podocytes. And typically what happens is that um, the alpha-3, alpha-4, and alpha-5 chains of type 4 collagen um, are expressed and they come together to form a triple helix, this 345 triple helix. This triple helix then comes together to um, form tetramers and that is your ultimate alpha-345 network within your glomerular basement membrane. So it's very specifically cross-linked to provide the strength um, to that basement membrane. If you have a severe col 4 5 mutation, say a truncating mutation, that alpha-5 is not expressed. So you have the normal alpha-3 and alpha-4, however, they can't form that triple helix. And if they can't form that triple helix, they're not able to survive in the wild on their own. So they end up getting degraded. So you end up, even though there's only a mutation in col 4 5 you end up um, having an, the absence of the alpha-3 and alpha-4 as well. So these chains um, get degraded. Uh, you have no 345 triple helix, and you end up with a more severe Alport syndrome phenotype. <laughs> 
If you have a more mild COL45 mutation, say there's just a missense mutation in the long collagen tail, you still may express alpha-5, and this happens in about 20 to 30% of patients with Alport syndrome where they'll still express some of the, um, of the chain. And they can still form the alpha helix. It's just an abnormal alpha helix. So you may have some of the 345 network in your basement membrane. It's just not quite working correctly. And these patients often have a milder Alport syndrome phenotype. So on immunofluorescence and Alport syndrome, you can see that on the immune, immunofluorescence. So in the normal situation, alpha-3, alpha-4, and alpha-5 are present along the basement membrane. So you can see they, they very nicely follow that kind of ribbon pattern along the basement membrane. And in a typical patient with um, the more severe type of X-linked Alport syndrome, there's no expression of any of those. In X-linked females, what we see is a mosaic expression of these. So depending on wh which X is expressed, you can see either normal um, of the alpha-5 and then areas where it's absent. And in patients with autosomal recessive disease, um, they similarly will have absence of all of the um, chains, alpha-3, alpha-4, and alpha-5 in the glomerular basement membrane. But you can see in Bowman's capsule here, um, alpha-5 is actually expressed. And that's because in Bowman's capsule, alpha-5 is present as part of a different alpha, a different triple helix, the alpha-5, alpha-5, alpha-6. Um, so this is a nice pathology trick. If you happen to see alpha-5 expressed in Bowman's capsule, but nowhere else, you can say, oh, well, this is probably a autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, um, and your pathologist will be very impressed. And the, I told you that the patients who have alpha-5 in their basement membrane have a little bit milder disease. And this was shown in a study a couple of years ago from Japan where they looked at um, 146 patients with uh, X-linked Alport syndrome, men with X-linked Alport syndrome. And in patients who, um, who were negative for alpha-5, so had no alpha-5, they reached end-stage kidney disease in their late 20s, whereas those who did were in their late 50s. So there can be quite a big difference between um, outcomes in patients, uh, depending on whether alpha-5 is present or not. So on light microscopy in Alport syndrome, it looks pretty unremarkable at first. Usually the, the, um, the gloms look pretty normal or you may see FSGS, um, especially later on in disease. And we're finding more and more that patients who are diagnosed with just FSGS on biopsy, kind of a classic nephrotic syndrome presentation, actually have mutations in type four collagen, particularly the autosomal dominant type of uh, disease. Now, electron microscopy early on in Alport syndrome, really all you see is a thinning of the basement membrane. Um, so you have to, at least in pediatrics, this changes with age. So we have to actually do measurements of the basement membrane, compare it to normal values. Every pathology lab is gonna be a little bit different. So you, they may have different normal values, but it's thinner than, it, thinner than normal. The foot processes are pretty um, intact uh, and that looks pretty normal as well. But later on in Alport syndrome, what you start to see is this more classic appearance of the Alport basement membrane. So there's thickening of the basement membrane, and this is usually so obvious you don't even have to measure it. It's just, it's very, very thick. Um, there's usually a podocyte effacement, especially over the areas of, um, of thickening. And then there's this basket weaving type of appearance. And it took me a long time to figure out, well, what are you talking about with basket weaving? But it's really just this striped sort of um, appearance of the basement membrane that you can see um, towards the top of the screen. <clears throat> and sometimes you can see all of those things in the same picture. So you may have areas of thinning next to areas of, of thickening and basket weaving in the same, um, the same image. So how then can you tell the difference between Alport syndrome and thin basement membrane nephropathy if you're looking um, at a biopsy? So some of those patients with thin basement membranes are going to progress to full-blown Alport syndrome, and some of them are just going to stay that way for their whole life. And I will just stop you there because thin basement membrane is a pathological description and it's not a disease. So thin basement membrane nephropathy should really not be a diagnosis that's, that's made for people.
And this is just a little bit of an aside, but it's uh, one of the coolest studies I've seen come out in the past uh, past month or so. Uh, but this was a study from Tobias Huber, where they actually found another gene that's associated with thin basement membranes. Um, so this is P3H2, and this is an enzyme that um, catalyzes hydroxylation of the proline residues of collagen 4. So it's responsible for keeping that um, that triple helix together. So if that's not present, that triple helix starts to come apart and um, doesn't work like it should. So early on, similar to Alport syndrome, patients with these mutations have thinning of their basement membrane. And then later on, they develop that classic thickening as well. So we don't really know how many patients might have this type of, type of mutation um, and how many patients we see with thin basement membranes who don't have type 4 collagen mutations might um, be affected by, by problems with this, uh, with this gene. Um, the families that they described also had eye abnormalities, some myopia, cataracts, lens subluxa subluxation. Um, but typically what happens with these things is that um, there's a more severe phenotype that's first described, and then you start to see the spectrum once you identify other, other families and patients. So this, this will be one to, to watch out for. And it's possible that um, something like this may be responsible for um, some of the patients, at least, with heterozygous COL4A3 or COL4A4 mutations. If you have a mutation here and then you have a mutation in um, type 4 collagen, that may be enough for those patients to move on to autosomal dominant disease. So back to Alport syndrome. Um, uh, the nomenclature of Alport syndrome has been a little bit problematic over the years, um, as I mentioned, with this thin basement membrane nephropathy idea. So um, several years ago, a group of Alport syndrome researchers came together and put together recommendations for classification. And we recommended that patients, even with a heterozygous col 4 3 or col 4 4 mutation, should be um, uh, declared as Alport syndrome. So they should get the name of Alport syndrome and then recognize that Alport syndrome is a spectrum where there may be a low risk of progression or high risk of progression. And there are a number of ad advantages to this type of a classification system. It groups together disorders with a shared molecular pathogenesis. So you would expect that treatments for one type would affect, would um, base or would uh, be able to benefit the others. It's based on clinical and genetic criteria, so a very clear criteria, and promotes consistent recommendations for monitoring and treatment. We know that um, women with X-linked Alport syndrome, for example, um, who had been who are identified as carriers, really don't get the follow-up that that they should be. Um, so this promotes that consistent monitoring. Now the disadvantages are emotional distress. So if you have a, a single um, COL4A3 mutation that's never going to cause any problems, you have this diagnosis of Alport syndrome and that is stressful. You look it up on Google, you can see how terrible it is um, and that can be stressful. And then also even within the Alport community, it's not a universally accepted concept. So in um, currently there's a group, uh, ClinGen, that's working on, on uh, coming up with an agreed upon nomenclature for these type four collagen disorders. So there will be, um, there will be some changes I, I predict coming up soon. So what are the risks of Alport syndrome? Um, so in males with Alport syndrome, there's about a 25% or sorry, there's about a 50% risk um, by age 25 and about an 80% risk of end-stage kidney disease by age uh, by age 40. So it's a, a real risk. And there you can see even in these kind of uh, early teen, mid-teen years, there's risk of end-stage kidney disease. Um, for women with X-linked Alport syndrome, there's about a 12% risk by age 40 and about a 30% risk by age 60. Um, and when I first started doing this work, 30% um, risk at age 60, it's like, those are all old people. I don't have to, you know, that's fine. Um, but now it's 60 is seeming early or younger and younger every day. So 30% risk of end-stage kidney disease at age 30 is a big deal for women. And this was really one of the first studies that showed um, that risk. Before that, um, even when you look way back to the original reports from Cecil Alport in 1927, he wrote that the females have deafness and hematuria and live to old age. 
And then even in the 60s, um, people were describing that females usually remain well throughout life and only rarely have women died of the disease. So really um, kind of minimize the importance of the of the kidney disease. And then when the, the study came out in the early 2000s, people really started to, to pay attention to that. So we wanted to look in our um, Alport syndrome registry. We have a registry at the University of Minnesota where people um, self-enroll. We collect um, clinical data on patients with Alport syndrome uh, prospectively. We started it in 2007, and we currently have a little over 700 patients um, that are enrolled. So we decided to look at our um, women with X-linked Alport syndrome. We had 265 women um, in our registry, and there was a low risk of end-stage kidney disease. So there was about a 3% risk um, at age 40 and about a 18% risk at age 60. So a little bit less than Europe. And th these uh, this data is about 20 years after the European data as well. So there may be some benefits of, of treatment in this um, in this cohort. We also looked at the risk of proteinuria by age. So this was the age um, proteinuria was first detected. And what we found is that there was about a 50% risk by age 40 um, to, of uh, these uh, women with X-linked Alport syndrome to have proteinuria. And um, there seemed to be a big uptick kind of in the late 20s um, and 30s. And we think that may be related to pregnancy, um, although we haven't um, haven't gone back to do that do that correlation. But the hyperfiltration that begin, you know that happens in pregnancy can be hard on that abnormal basement membrane and maybe just enough to push people over the edge. So why is there such variability in the outcomes for women with X-linked Alport syndrome? 5% of women with X-linked Alport syndrome don't, don't even have hematuria, um, and some go on to end-stage kidney disease. So there's this huge spectrum. Um, some of this has to do with X chromosome inactivation. So in uh, women, there's two X chromosomes, and that, of course, wouldn't be fair if women had two and men only had one. So nature has designed a way to um, turn off one of those X chromosomes very early on, and then that holds through uh, through every um, cell division that happens. And what you end up with is a mosaic tissue where some of the cells are expressing the paternal X and some are expressing the maternal X. So depending on what the percentage is of each of those, you will have either more of your mutant COL4A5 allele, or you will have more of the normal COL4A5 allele. In a perfect world, it's a 50-50 split. However, just from random chance, you may be 60-40 or 70-30. Um, it's this bell curve that, that you see in nature. So if you're skewed more normally, you may just have a little bit of hematuria and proteinuria, and that's all, your, all, you, all you have your whole life. If you're skewed more toward the mutant allele, you may be more likely to develop end-stage kidney disease, hearing loss, or the eye problems. Now, unfortunately, there's no um, convenient way to measure X inactivation. When we did this um, in our mouse model, we had to take the kidneys out, grind them up, and measure the mRNA from, from all of the, the kidneys. So we can't really do that in people. Um, so it's not really a, a convenient. It's more of kind of a theoretical risk, but not something we can use to identify individual risk. Um, patients with autosomal recessive Alport syndrome um, behave very similarly to men with, um, with X-linked Alport syndrome. So they have about a, a risk of their risk of end-stage kidney disease 50% by age 20. And patients with autosomal dominant Alport syndrome have much later onset of disease. Um, their median age of end-stage kidney disease is around 67 years. And the timing is very similar here on the left graph between col 4 a 3 in blue and col 4 a 4 in red. So it's not one of these is not more severe than the other. And they also looked in this study at the severity of the mutations, whether the uh, mutations were truncating in red, which would be those more severe mutations, or if they were um, non-truncating or often just those missense mutations in blue. And there wasn't a significant difference there either. So there's something else um, about uh, those patients that's making them progress. There's not a clear genotype phenotype correlation like there is in X-linked Alport syndrome. Now, unfortunately, there are no FDA or other regulatory body approved treatments for Alport syndrome. And 20 years ago, 
Um, you know, a lot of people didn't think you even need to made, make a diagnosis of Alport syndrome because there was nothing you could do to treat it anyway. So why, why um, you know, make, make the diagnosis or test, test the kids? It's just going to make them nervous. So the big million dollar question in Alport syndrome is how does that absence of the alpha-345 network lead to kidney injury and in end stage kidney disease? Because we know that this basement membrane, even though it's very thin, um, doesn't look normal, it still functions pretty normal. So these really young kids don't have any proteinuria, they have normal GFR. <clears throat> so it's not the absence of the network itself, it's what happens because that network is absent that leads to this thickening and abnormal basement membrane. So if we can understand those signals, we can help design drugs and design treatments that can help to slow that down. Because if we could keep the basement membrane arrested in this early stage, you can probably get by for a, a maybe even your entire life without needing dialysis. So to start to think about what's going on there, we have to think about how the what are the properties of the outport basement membrane. And the normal basement membrane, of course, has this 345 network. And in the outport basement membrane, what you have is the um, type 4 collagen 112 network. And that's a, a fetal um, type 4 collagen network that then persists. So normally what happens is the 112 network is there first and then at, at some point the alpha 345 takes over and the 112 network goes away. Um, but in patients with Alport syndrome, that 112 network persists. And that network, even though it's still a type 4 collagen trimer, it's a little bit different. Um, it's less cross-linked um, and it's more susceptible to breakdown or proteolysis by um, matrix metalloproteases. So the, the properties of the basement membrane because of that type 4 collagen are, are a little bit different. There are also different laminin chains. So type 4 collagen isn't the only thing there, even though I like to think it is sometimes. Um, but the, the typical basement membrane has a 5 to one laminin network and the Alport basement membrane um, has, uh, has different laminin chains. And this also confers different properties. And what we end up with is that this Alport basement membrane is more distensible. So when the basement membrane is, um, is uh, 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 exposed to the normal pressures within the glomerulus, it's going to be more stretchy. And when it's more stretchy, um, all kinds of bad things happen. So the podocytes are not happy to be sitting on this basement membrane that's stretching. Um, the podocytes uh, express more of these matrix metalloproteases. They increase the um, excretion of matrix and they lay down more matrix, which leads to some of the thickening that we see. And then the podocytes also start to invade the basement membrane as well. We don't really understand why they're doing that. Um, the other thing that happens in response to stress and strain on the basement on the basement membrane is that endothelial cells start to produce more endothelin one, and when endothelin one is expressed, they trigger the mesangial cells again to invade the basement membrane, and they lay down some of their mesangial laminins, which are these two uh, laminin two one one that we tend to to see in the Alport basement membrane, and then of course there's um, increased inflammatory signaling um, and profibrotic signaling that happens as well. So as we are thinking about those uh, mechanisms, the first thing that we can do to try to slow down the progression is to take off, uh, reduce that stretch and strain on the basement membrane. And we can do that very simply with RAS inhibitors, which of course dilate the efferent arterial and reduce glomerular hyperfiltration. And there have been a number of retrospective studies over the years that looked, uh, that have associated Alport's, or, treatment with RAS inhibition with uh, later onset of end-stage kidney disease. And of course, these are, um, these are retrospective studies, so they can't be causative, but uh, they can give us a pretty good idea. So this is a Japanese study of, of men with X-linked Alport syndrome, and they divided patients into um, severe or non-severe mutations. So they looked um, patients with truncating mutations and their renal survival was about 16 years um, for the patients with truncating mutations who had never gotten treatment with ACE inhibitors, and about 28 years for those who had received treatment with, um, with ACE inhibitors. Um, for patients with the more minor mutations, uh, the uh, time to end-stage kidney disease was about 33, uh, median of 33 for patients who had not been treated, and then over 50 in patients who had received treatment with um, ACE or ARB. And I think this was an important study because it showed us that even patients who, 
that we thought were the most severe. So they have absolutely no um, type 4 collagen in their basement membrane. They, they can benefit from treatment with ACE inhibitors. Um, and the benefit, you know, you think, well, from 16 to 28, that's not too big of a deal. It's 12 years. Um, but that's a huge difference developmentally. So these, um, the, the difference between needing dialysis or transplant at age 16 and dialysis or transplant at age 28 is a huge deal. It allows these kids to get through college, to get their career started, you know, start their, um, their life partnering. Um, so that, that can be a big deal. So ACE inhibitors um, can really have an, an, an uh, can have a good outcome no matter what the uh, mutation type. And in fact, some patients treatment with ACE and ARB may prevent kidney failure for their whole life. So this was a very recent um, paper that came out looking at a group of European patients who all have the same mutation. So it's very difficult to look at studies of all comers with Alport syndrome because the outcome is going to be so variable. You might it just through normal chance, some patients may reach end stage at, at 20, some may reach end stage at 40, depending on what their mutation is. Um, but for this study, they looked at 114 men with X-linked Alport syndrome who all had the exact same mutation. So this was a very, a very nice way to do it. And they divided um, the patients into those who were uh, treated with ACE or ARB early, so before their GFR was less than 60, and those are the patients in blue, and in patients who um, were either never treated with ACE or ARB or were treated once their GFR was already less than 60. And they found that none of the earlier treated patients had reached end-stage kidney disease, although the numbers are pretty low when you get out there. Um, but uh, many, many of the uh, untreated patients had. So some patients with these very minor mutations, you may be able to stop um, kidney disease entirely. And a COL4A5 variant in a male um, is then no longer an invariable sentence to dialysis or transplant. Um, we also know that the age at transplant is increasing for patients with Alport syndrome, and we think that this is partly due to the delays related to treatment. So um, if we look at the blue line here, these are white patients um, in the U.S. Uh, they, uh, back in the late 1980s, the median age at transplant was 33, and this has increased to about 38, so about a five-year increase in time to transplant um, in those patients. Now, unfortunately, um, there has not been that same increase for Black or Hispanic patients. They have been pretty flat. And of course, we know there's already um, racial disparities in access to transplant, but I, uh, I suspect there is, this also reflects um, uh, access to diagnosis of Alport syndrome. Um, I think it's probably underdiagnosed in African-American patients. Um, and then also um, uh, uh, lack of, uh, of, tr of aggressive treatment. So those are definitely areas uh, that can be improved. So if starting ACE inhibitors in patients with Alport syndrome is good, how early should we be starting these drugs? Um, this is a study that was uh, that was published a couple years ago, trying to answer that question of whether starting ACE inhibitors in children before they even develop proteinuria. Um, can be beneficial. So they, this is a study that randomized children to ramipril or placebo. Um, these kids were between the ages of 2 and 18, and they either just had isolated hematuria or microalbuminuria, so very, very early stage. All had normal GFR and blood pressure. And unfortunately, this study was under-enrolled. So um, at the time that this study was enrolling, providers in Germany where it was being performed were already offering their patients um, preemptive treatment with, with ACE inhibitors who had Alport syndrome. So there were not very many families who were willing to be in, uh, randomized at that point. <clears throat> so they only had 22 who were randomized, um, but the 44 who were, did not want to be randomized, they were still enrolled in an open, open label observation study. And I think one of, one of the, the benefits of this um, trial is that we got really good safety data. So there's um, thousands of patient months worth of safety data um, of Ramapro, and there really was no signal for, for um, problems with safety in these patients. It was all tolerated pretty well. And of course, there was a a trend toward improved outcomes where the 
um, they didn't, their proteinuria didn't progress, but um, overall, uh, uh, we learned that the drug is is safe in, in young children with Alport syndrome. And, and this study will never be able to be done again because these patients are already being offered preemptive therapy. So based on that, um, the clinical practice guidelines were, were updated and the recommendations are that the patients at risk for severe disease, so um, boys with X-linked Alport syndrome or boys and girls with autosomal recessive Alport syndrome should be offered treatment at the time of diagnosis if they're over one to two years of age. And for the um, girls with X-linked Alport syndrome or patients with autosomal dominant Alport syndrome should be offered treatment once they develop albuminuria. So once they show you that they're in that category of patients who are at risk of progression. Now this um, can be a tough sell. Um, we're telling families to start medications that are going to be lifelong, um, lifelong treatments. And some families are very interested in that. They may have a uncle or grandfather who needed dialysis and they've seen them kind of suffer through that. Um, other families, you know, it's more important for them that their kid not have to take a medicine and, and feel different. So um, uh, in that early stage, it's a discussion with families. There's a lot of shared decision making and, and deciding what's best for their family and then regardless, close follow up. Now, uh, clinical trials are very challenging um, in Alport syndrome. So as I mentioned, it's it's a rare disease. So these patients are not very easy to find. Um, it's relatively slowly progressive. So especially if you're looking at um, children, you have to follow them for a really long time before you're going to see any change in their in their GFR. And it's a very um, heterologous disease. So they, um, you know, we have the different genetics, we have the differences depending on gender. So it's just um, clinical trials are challenging. So in uh, 2018, the Alport Syndrome Foundation came together and put together a workshop um, of patients, pharmaceutical um, industry, research, clinical stakeholders, um, to come up with recommendations for clinical trials in patients with Alport Syndrome. The patients really felt that it was important that they have a voice in um, determining how these trials would be done and what kind of outcomes there, that they would be looking at. And the recommendations were for kidney outcomes, um, looking at GFR for at least one year over a phase two study, um, two years for a phase three study was uh, reasonable. And we really know that we need to look at proteinuria um, as a, as a uh, outcome for, for, for studies in children. Um, for secondary outcomes, the patients felt very strongly that they wanted hearing loss looked at in all of these all of these studies. We we forget about it as as kidney doctors, and I haven't really even talked about it at all today. Um, but this really affects their quality of life. And um, patients who have hearing loss, they want to know if these medicines that they're taking for kidney disease are going to help with the with the hearing, or if it's going to have any impact. Um, also, wanted to be sure that patient reported outcomes were included. So now we're going to talk about just a couple of the, the clinical trials that are that are ongoing and that are um, that are in the works. So one drug that's being looked at currently is uh, an anti microRNA 21 agent and microRNA 21 is upregulated in outport kidney and this is involved in fibrosis pathways. So the more um, uh, MIR21 you have, the more fibrosis you have. And if you treat these um, mice with uh, with uh, anti-microRNA 21 agent, they live longer. So these are patients who are either treated with nothing, so they die at around 12 weeks, um, treated with uh, uh, anti-microRNA 21. There was really a minimal benefit to just treatment with that. Um, and however, the combination of an ACE inhibitor and microRNA 21 agent really um, significantly improved survival for those um, for those animals. So, given this and some other mouse data, um, there's a clinical trial, a phase two study of latimersin, which is this anti-microRNA 21 agent, um, versus placebo. Uh, it's enrolled 45 subjects, all adult patients, and either uh, male or female with Alport syndrome have to have a GFR between 35 and 90, 
and they have to have some sort of signal that they are at risk for progression. So you don't want to enroll patients in a clinical trial who aren't going to progress. So you don't want a lot of patients with autosomal dominant disease who are just going to have a flat GFR um, or women with X-linked Alport syndrome because they're, they're, you're not going to be able to see much difference. So um, the uh, criteria we came up with were GFR, great, uh, lot, GFR loss of greater than four per minute over the past couple of years before the study. Um, proteinuria, uh, significant proteinuria, or if they're a male, um, uh, a young male with X-linked Alport syndrome where their GFR is dropping already. We know that they're at risk. Um, the uh, primary outcome was a change in GFR at 48 weeks, and it was a randomized study for uh, 48 weeks, and then everybody gets uh, open label extension. And this study is, um, is fully enrolled and is currently um, uh, currently being uh, in, in the follow-up stages, so we'll be interested to see what happens there. So the next um, mechanism that we'll look at is endothelin receptor blockade. So I mentioned that endothelin um, is activated with that stretch of the basement membrane. So if you block endothelin with an endothelin receptor blocker, um, these mice with Alport syndrome have less fibrosis, have less um, sclerotic glomeruli, they produce less of these matrix metalloproteases that break down the basement membrane, and the lifespan of the animals is, is longer. Now, citizentan um, is off the market because it causes liver toxicity, so we can't, can't use that one anymore. But there are other endothelin receptor blockers available. So acrocentin um, is one that, that many of us have heard of before. So this is currently, there's currently an ongoing trial looking at um, the use of atrocentin in patients with Alport syndrome. And this is a basket study, so there's a number of other studies or uh, conditions that are being included, but at least 20 patients with Alport syndrome. Um, again, adult patients um, with a relatively modest protein to creatinine ratio, just greater than 0.5. And the primary um, outcome that this study is looking for is simply change in proteinuria from baseline to week 12. It's a phase two study. They're just looking for any signal whatsoever that this may be useful in patients with Alport syndrome. And if they see that, then they will um, design a, a, a better phase three trial to actually learn something. Um, and then they'll actually also look at the change in GFR at one year. And this study is also looking at audiometry, so doing hearing studies at the beginning and at the end of the study. Um, there's not any data that atrocentin has an effect on hearing, but there is data with another um, endothelin receptor blocker, sparsentin, which is an endothelin receptor blocker and um, angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, and that drug in animal models actually prevents hearing loss. So um, people in the Alport community are very excited that there may be a drug out there that could benefit both the hearing loss and the kidney disease. Um, the next drug to talk about is bardoxolone. Um, so bardoxolone is an anti-inflammatory agent and it works by um, increasing the GFR. And of course, we've all heard of it from the Beacon study where uh, in diabetic kidney disease, there would increase risk of heart failure, cardiovascular disease and death. Um, in patients who are treated. So this, um, this study or this drug um, is not currently approved. And for the other pathways, uh, I've shown you some of the, the mouse model data that shows um, benefit in animal models, but unfortunately in Bardoxolone, there isn't any um, animal data that has, been, that has been published. So we don't have animal data. Um, but, and there's a lot of um, question in the Alport community community about whether the in increase in GFR as caused by bardoxolone is actually a good thing for patients with Alport syndrome. So if the black line here of GFR is the typical decline in GFR over time, the green line is patients who are treated with RAS inhibition. So there's that initial drop in GFR that happens when you start it and then the slower decline so that the eventual time to end stage kidney disease is later. And the concern is that with bardoxolone, maybe there's an increase in GFR um, initially and due to hyperfiltration or whatever um, else may be going on, the GFR declines at a faster rate and you actually end up with, um, with end-stage kidney disease sooner. And if you stop a trial at one year, for example, um, you may, things may look artificially um, good. So the, the concern was that we really do need longer long-term data um, for any trial uh, with this drug. Uh, 
So this study um, enrolled 157 subjects, so I think it was important in that it showed that these trials can be enrolled. Um, this was really the first, um, one of the first clinical trials in Alport syndrome where people were wondering, would people even enroll in these trials, would be able to find them, um, how, hard would the, how hard would this be? And we found that, yes, we can find these patients and, and enroll them into trials. Um, the primary endpoint was change in baseline GFR from placebo to week 48, and then secondary endpoints were um, uh, change in GFR after a washout, a four-week washout. This study also used, um, also did hearing studies and then quality of life exams. Um, patients were randomized one to one, and the the dose uh, differed depending on where your albumin to creatinine ratio was. Um, from earlier studies, they knew that patients with more proteinuria needed more drug. And the baseline um, data from the cohort's been published. Um, and the, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but the ones that I think are important are the sex distribution of patients. So 58% of patients enrolled in the trial were women. Um, which is not really what you would expect for a X-linked disease. So already knowing that, you know that this isn't that this trial doesn't include the, those typical um, Alport syndrome patients that you that you may be taking care of. Um, also enrolled pediatric patients. So we had um, there were 23 pediatric patients in this study, and about 31% of the patients were um, had autosomal disease. So again, a, a little bit of a different. Um, <clears throat> group of patients. The other thing that I find interesting are the, the percentage of patients with hematuria. Um, only 86% of the patients had hematuria, which I don't really understand how they how they have a, an Alport syndrome diagnosis without, without hematuria, so would love to be able to dig into that a little bit more. Um, and the study uh, did meet its primary endpoint. So looking at change in uh, GFR at week 48, in placebo patients, they lost 4.7 um, GFR and bardoxolone increased by 4.5. And this difference held up after that washout period. Um, and same when they looked at um, uh, the, uh, sorry, after the washout. Um, a lot of patients who were treated with bardoxolone discontinued treatment. So there were a lot of side effects um, and intolerance of the drug. And the study was uh, submitted to the FDA uh, late last year, and they had a number of concerns. One was on the handling of missing data. So those patients who dropped out of the study, how they were accounted for um, in, the, in the analysis. There was concern about the length of the washout period, so that four weeks wasn't thought to be enough um, of a washout. Uh, and then there were some safety concerns. So this drug did increase the albumin to creatinine ratio in the urine, um, and there were concerns about that. Um, increased blood pressure slightly. Um, there was uh, not an increase in heart failure in this study, um, but I think there were still residual concerns from the, from the past Beacon study. And then there was concern about body weight, particularly in children. So patients treated with bardoxolone lose weight. Um, for our adult patients, they did not mind that. They thought that was fine. But for our pediatric um, patients, we really aren't interested in them losing weight. So um, patients in this, the adolescents didn't lose weight in this study, but they didn't gain weight either. So their weight was flat, um, which was uh, a concerning finding. So the, the ADCOM meeting, when asked whether um, the drug should be approved, they all agreed that no, it should not be approved. And then later on, that was confirmed. So Bardoxolone is back at the drawing board. So take home points today. If you remember one thing, um, remember that autosomal dominant Alport syndrome, that's more common than previously recognized that women with X-linked Alport syndrome are at risk for progressive chronic kidney disease and even end-stage kidney disease. Be aggressive about treatment of patients with Alport syndrome and proteinuria with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, whatever they can tolerate, um, and that new therapies are coming. So there's a lot of drugs in development currently. Um, it's not going to be Bardoxolone. Um, and please enroll your patients in clinical trials if you have any ongoing. So that is how we are going to move this field forward. Um, just want to acknowledge our um, ASTER coordinators and the Alport Syndrome Foundation. This is a group of kids with um, Alport Syndrome that I've worked with um, at various family meetings, and it's always very inspiring just to, to hear their stories and, and to see how they're really looking up to me and the rest of the Alport Syndrome researchers to, to do something and to make change. So it's always very motivating to go to these meetings.
And then a plug for the Elport syndrome registry. We do enroll patients from Canada as well. So if patients um, want to self enroll, all they have to do is go to alportregistry.org and then our coordinators take over from there. They um, they reach out to the families, make uh, uh, get consent and then uh, collect their clinical data. So that is all I have today and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Michelle. That was a wonderful, uh, fabulous overview. Uh, I, I learned many things uh, and I'll stop using thin basement membrane disease as a clinical <laughs> diagnosis. I should go back and change the uh, the my records for that. Um, so uh, I, I'll start the ball rolling. If anyone has questions, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, we, we mostly, I mean, the Children's Hospital does do gen genotyping. Uh, we mostly don't uh, and I'm sure I have you know, mislabeled many FSGS as FSGS or what have you. Is there is there a role for us to, you know, we give them ACE inhibitors mostly. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this something we should be looking at? I, I know the pediatric community is way more uh, intense in doing, you know, whole genome sequencing and all that, and, and we haven't. Is it something that you think will be useful? Yeah, I think that the, um, the genetic testing, knowing your your genotype is important. Um, it can help you to know how at, how at risk you are of progression. It depends on where you are in the progress. But if you know you have a truncating mutation, for example, you know you're at risk of very early onset end stage kidney disease. And those are patients that you might, you know, really push the ACE inhibitors hard or start them very very early. Um, so from that standpoint, it's useful. Um, it can also help. Um, to identify other family members who are at risk. So if you know somebody has X-linked Alport syndrome, then you can kind of go through the family tree and, and decide who, you know, who else should be screened or who should be who should be tested. Um, so for those are the main two reasons that we use the genetic testing for. In the future, it may be useful for treatment. So there's a Japanese group that's working on exon skipping, and they have very specific types of mutations that can that that can be used for. So they um, they are looking uh, looking for patients with those specific mutations. Yeah, and the, yeah, I hadn't thought about the families. Uh, it does make a lot mm -hmm. of sense uh, that yep. we may be able to find more people who don't know what mm -hmm. they have, yeah, uh, rather than diagnose them late. Um, the um, I, I didn't know about the X-link being uh, the women and the autosomal dominant being so common as well. Of course, um, you showed that the autosomal recessive uh, you get ESKD much earlier. Is there a reason for that? Is there something different uh, pathologically uh, in, in those folks that this um, happens? Is it just an observation? I, yeah, I think the um, the physiology is pretty much the same as the severe X-linked Dalport syndrome patients. So they're missing that entire three, four, five chain in their basement membrane. So they they look very similar to the severe X-linked Dalport syndrome. So they fo basically follow that um, that. Uh, uh, progression, whereas the X-linked females and the autosomal dominant patients, they still have normal, at least some normal type four collagen in their basement membrane, so they're a little bit milder. Right, right, that would make sense. The in terms of the therapeutics, um, uh, apart from ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, and the uh, molecules that you mentioned that are in trials, I've heard of. Um, uh, cyclosporin, uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Is that uh, something? Uh, again, this was, you know, I, I inherited a patient from uh, the children's hospital who was on on that. Is that uh, something that you have seen, or uh, uh, is there any data on that? Yeah, yeah. So there, there is some old data from Italy where patients were treated with cyclosporin, and it does reduce protein in the urine um, for patients who who have proteinuria. Um, but what they found is that it uh, it when it when tested in a dog model of Alport syndrome actually worsens the fibrosis. So I think most people are not using cyclosporin for to for treatment of Alport syndrome at this point. Yeah. But the drugs that we are really excited about are the SGLT2 inhibitors. So of course, you adult nephrologists know that these should be just put in the water and they, that they are going to treat everything. Um, and in, in Alport syndrome, there's good reason to think that they would be beneficial because they also reduce that um, uh, intraglomerular pressure and take some of that pressure off the, the glomerular basement membrane. And if we can do that, that may slow things down as well, in addition to the, the ACE inhibitors. 
Now, we were in discussions with one of the companies um, that has a SGLT2 inhibitor to do a clinical trial on Alport syndrome, and they were very close, had a protocol almost completely written, and then they kind of threw up their hands and said, nope, I guess we don't want to do that. And it's because they they don't need a, a indication for Alport syndrome. Their FDA indication is going to be chronic kidney disease. And patients with chronic kidney disease, the Alport syndrome patients will fall under that. So there's no um, benefit to the company to, to having a uh, Alport syndrome indication. So we're disappointed in that, but we're hoping that we can, um, you know, maybe get a pediatric trial going in that population because that would be a very, um, a very useful thing to see. Yeah, I can see that happening just like the ACE inhibitor story, right? Like once it has an indication, people mm -hmm. may be even reluctant uh, to enroll. I hope, I hope you do get the study of the <laughs> uh, board. Um, Dr. Bujaya. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for uh, Hi. for a great talk. Nice to meet you. Um, in our Living Kidney Donor Program, uh, we've biopsied uh, donor candidates with isolated microscopic hematuria uh, with a recipient that hasn't been diagnosed with Alports, of course. Um, and we generally approve the donors with thin basement membrane disease. And I know I'm not supposed to say that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we do so with a bit of trepidation, given some of the case reports um, of uh, not so good prognosis out there. And I was wondering if you would recommend for their testing of those donor candidates or or um, if we should be taking a different approach. Yeah, so I, I don't know data on just the thin basement membrane appearance of the biopsy outcomes for those patients. We do have some data on using um, kind of Alport carriers or the women with X-linked Alport syndrome as donors. And in those um, those patients that, that have been reported, they do tend to have a more rapid loss of GFR after donation. Um, and they do tend to have more chronic, more risk of chronic kidney disease, even in the kind of short five to 10 years after donation. So um, we generally recommend that women with X-linked Alport syndrome, even if they only have the thin basement membrane, really not be um, not be used as as kidney donors. So our our general approach um, in the donors is to uh, to do the genetic testing if there's a concern for thin basement membrane or if there's microscopic hematuria. Although that can sometimes be hard to interpret as well. Come back with a variant of unknown significance and then you're back where you started from. Thank you. Right, right. So is that? I mean, I'm sure there are many mutations. Is this like a bunch of mutations that these uh, whole genome sequencing or what have you. Uh, again, you know, I don't even know the nomenclature. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Alport genes, the, the COL4A3, COL4A4, and COL4A5 genes are huge. They're 55 exons each. They're very, very big genes, and there's no real hotspot areas for mutation. So you can have mutations all the way through the, the gene. So there's about 1,500 unique mutations that have been identified for, for COL4A5 alone. So it's, um, you know, the chances are if you get an, a mutation, it may very well be one that's never been described before. So um, you can you can often get that kind of report back. Um, uh, Dr. Fathead. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent talk. Um, I was certainly interested in, in the results, particularly the results of women with mutations and uh, I've certainly seen that in my practice, uh, slow progressing CKD uh, in females that have a family history of X-linked Alports. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the genetics and uh, part of this is logistics for us uh, here in Ottawa specifically. Um, traditionally, we would refer to the genetics for counseling and for testing. Um, but that's a very long process. Um, uh, adult patients are not prioritized for genetics um, because it's run through the pediatric hospital. Um, but we also I, do have the ability to do that ourselves as well. Um, but part of it is the interpretation, particularly when you get these, um, you know, variants of unknown significance where you're left with, uh, you know, if you don't have a great uh, kind of structure function, a knowledge of the, the, the gene to protein, you, you may be stuck not knowing what to tell the patient. Um, yeah. I guess, do you do genetic counseling yourself? And what do you tell a patient before you order genetics? 
And, um, you know, would it be reasonable, do you think, for nephrologists to be ordering genetics and then referring on based on the results if we're struggling with interpretation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And you're right that it, the genetic counselors are really, um, really helpful from this from this standpoint. And I do refer all of our patients for genetic for genetic counseling. And for us, it's um, it's very practical because our genetic counselors are the ones who do all of our insurance paperwork. So they're the ones who can tell, OK, this test is going to be covered by by this insurance and, and can help us get through that point. But they also do a really great job with the families um, going through all of those potential outcomes before they even um, before they even send the test. So, you know, very clear that we may find a mutation in this. That's that's gives us the answer. We may find a variant of unknown significance, and this is what that means, um, or we may find nothing at all. So they they set it up very nicely from the beginning. So if I'm, um, you know, I, I do some counseling on my own before I even send them to the genetic counselor, and we do go through kind of those um, those uh, those issues before before I send them off. But the genetic counselors are are really good at um, you know helping us with that. So it's um, it's a little we have a little bit easier access to them. It sounds like, and especially for pediatric patients. And and you would support genetic counseling before just sending off. Uh, yeah, it seems yeah. like I like yeah. I like people to know what they're what they're getting themselves into um, when we do the genetic testing. And for me, if somebody else in the family has had genetic testing. Um, I, I don't necessarily do it again and in the child's, you know, so if their grandfather knows they have this missense mutation and the kid has hematuria, um, that's good enough for me to to make that diagnosis. Um, yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, like Todd said, you know, we have we send them off to the children's hospital. Uh, it mm -hmm. takes a few months for them to be triaged and seen, uh, which is, you know, which causes uh, a little bit of uh, frustration on our side about you know we are waiting forever um yeah. for for even for the testing to be uh, done which which often is a send off somewhere else anyways um the other so, benefit uh, of the genetic testing is that a lot of the clinical trials now are requiring genetic testing before patients can be enrolled so we have to prove that patients have a genetic um, genetic mutation before they're enrolled yeah yeah and then again i'm i'm fully supporting of that like we don't know what we are doing Often, uh, when we are not even looking for these uh, for these mutations, uh, in terms of therapeutics, uh, is there anything else? Like, is Bardax alone? Uh, are they have they decided to stop, or are they doing a longer follow up, or a or a different study? What can you tell us? Uh, I'm not at liberty to to say where where that program is at. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, I mean, but as you pointed out, the lack of animal model uh, and those concerns are genuine. Uh, it it looked like. Uh, you know, this just looked like an opportunistic uh, um, clinical um, exploration uh, that that they had done. Uh, but the other molecules are interesting. The the yeah, uh, yeah. there's a physiologic basis for kind of the use of all those uh, the different agents that are currently in trials. So, um, you know, none of them are a cure. We didn't really talk about any of those avenues. You know, the CRISPR gene editing and um, some of the work that Jeff Miner is doing to kind of type 4 collagen into the basement membrane, um, kind of working on, on strategies to be able to do that, because we know that even a little bit of type 4 collagen in the basement membrane is good. So if you can figure out a way to deliver that even after patients are born or later on in life, that may be enough to just slow things down. So he has some some nice proof of concept models in, in mice that that can show that that can that can work. Fantastic. So uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Rowe, for that wonderful overview of Alport and all the quick Q and A's and discussion. Uh, th this session is being recorded and it will be available to viewers on uh, on the uh, on our YouTube channel later on uh, when I upload it. Um, and all of you will get a survey for uh, evaluations as well. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll one day have Dr. Rowe in person and meet. Uh, you know, I don't know the, when we will next meet. I have I have never been to Ottawa, so would love to come. Yeah, that would be wonderful. We should arrange for that. <laughs> thank you again. All right, thank you. And I'm happy to be a resource on Alport syndrome if there's any questions that come up along the way.